3% and consider that the current water injection is sufficient for cooling. We have calibrated the water level gauge in the building of units 1 and 2. In unit 1, when we calibrated the reactor water level gauge by injecting water into the reference leg on May 11th, and it was confirmed that the water level was more than 5 meters below the top of the active fuel and that there was little water inside. At unit 2, we have injected water into the reference leg twice, on June 22nd and October 21st, respectively. On June 22nd, we could not flood the pipes both on the reference leg side and on the reactor side as the temperature was high. On October 21st, the pipe on the reference leg side was flooded as the temperature inside the PCV was decreasing. The reactor side could not be flooded, however. Same as the case of Unit 1. We evaluated that the water level in Unit 2 was more than 5 meters below the top of the active fuel from the observation right after the water injection. The reason why the water in the pipe on the reactor side gradually evaporated is estimated to be the high temperature conducted from the heat generated by the damaged fuel in the metal-made reactor vessel. We have not conducted a calibration of the water level gauge in Unit 3 due to a high radiation dose. However, estimates are that Unit 3 is in the same situation as Unit 2. This is how TEPCO considers the RPV's status. Next is the status evaluation of PCV. The evaluation of units 1 and 2 derives from the analysis of the gas sample. In unit 1, we detected cesium-134 and 137 in the sampled gas on September 14th. In Unit 2, in addition to cesium-134 and 137, krypton-85 and xenon-131M were also found in the gas sampled on August 9. We estimated that more fuel fell off from the RPV to the PCV in Unit 1 than in Unit 2, as it turned out that cesium concentration was higher in Unit 1. The next slide describes the PCV status estimated per the analysis of the Reactor Closed Cooling Water System, or RCW in short. The fuel falls into the space called the uh, pedestal when it falls off from the RPV to the PCV. The pedestal is equipped with the square-shaped drain sump pit to receive the water generated inside the PCV. As shown in the diagram, the drain sump pit has a loop system in order to cool the RCW heat exchanger, which is designed to treat the high temperature water from the reactor. If the melted fuel fell into the drain sump pit from the RPV, it is estimated that the pipes were damaged by the melted fuel. The water inside the PCW pipes leaked through such damaged parts, and radioactive materials flowed into the PCW pipes with the steam. The analysis of the PCW pipes into which radioactive materials flow is included in today's workshop materials. We consider that such an estimation accords with the high radiation dose detected around the PCW pipes. Considering the radiation in the RCW, the melted fuel is estimated to fall into this spot. Next is the evaluation of the current situation of units 1 to 3 per the thermometer reading. For unit 1, the readings from March 22nd to date are plotted in the slide. While the reading indicates a high temperature above 200 degrees Celsius right after the accident, the temperature started to come down from the beginning of April, which was different behavior from units 2 and 3, and the decreasing trend was stable. Therefore, most of the damaged fuel is considered to fall from the RPV into the PCV. The temperature went down below 100 degrees Celsius at the beginning of August and below 40 degrees Celsius in mid-October when the injected amount of water increased. Therefore, we consider that the heat generation inside the RPV is rather small. This slide shows the latest data, including the data around October 28th when the injected water through the feed water system was gradually increased. The temperature in the suppression chamber increased because there was little damaged fuel in the RPV, and as a result, more water heated by cooling the fuel flow into the chamber. 
In Unit 2, there were ups and downs in the temperature movement, including the hike above 200 degrees Celsius till the end of May. The reactor was unstable during this period, and the temperature varied due to the variation of water flow and the movement of damaged fuel, most of which remained within the RPV. Thereafter, water injection that started from September 14th was directly sprayed onto the fuel inside the shroud, and the temperature at most of the measurement points uh, went below 100 degrees Celsius. Therefore, we estimate that most of the fuel remains in the RPV and sufficient cooling has been secured. Like Unit 2, as for Unit 3, high temperatures over 200 degrees with repeated ups and downs were measured at the end of June, but temperatures were decreased gradually. We presume that the temperatures were decreased to below 100 degrees because the water injection from the core spray water system from September first increased the efficiency of cooling. Like Unit 2, since most of the fuel is left in the RPV, evaluations show that the fuel is being cooled via present water injection. From the above, we will summarize the status of each unit. It is assumed that a considerable amount of the damaged fuel in Unit 1 has melted down to the bottom of the PCV. This assumption is consistent with the MAP analysis, the indicated level of the water level gauge, and mainly the heat balance evaluation based on the water injection record. Also, we think it matches the fact that the cesium concentration in the PCV is higher than that of Unit 2 and that the exposure dose is high at the RCW lines. On the other hand, currently, water injection is continued through the feed water line so that the temperature at the bottom of the RPV and inside of the PCV has been stabilized below 100 degrees. As shown on the chart, there is concrete in order to flatten the bottom of the PCV flask. It is about 2.7 meters in thickness and 37 centimeters in depth because there is no area where water comes out physically from the bottom to the vent pipes. As for Unit 1, we are injecting nitrogen through the area around there. We assume there is no water above the line because nitrogen can be injected, and we think the surface of the water is about 30 to 40 centimeters high from the bottom of the PCV. Therefore, the fuel which dropped from the RPV is assumed to have accumulated under the pedestal, and all the removed all the moved fuel is expected to be cooled directly by the covered water. So the temperature inside of the PCV has stabilized below 100 degrees Celsius. Having, in, ex, having explained in detail at the workshop, we are judging that the dropped fuel has not gone through the bottom of the flask of the PCV. The reason is that even if the moved fuel was dropped on the square, square block of the pedestal pit, it would be stopped at a depth of approximately 70 centimeters. Also, according to the gas sampling result in the PCV, the CO2 density which was caused by the core concrete reaction was so low that it is highly unlikely that the core concrete reaction is still occurring. As for the PCVs of Units 2 and 3, from the MAP analysis and the heat balance based on the water injection record, we assume that the damaged fuel remains at the bottom of the RPV. There is a possibility that the damaged fuel dropped to the bottom of the PCV through the weak point. Uh, for example, the control rod guide tube uh, or the neutron instrumentation pipe. But we think almost all the fuel remains inside the RPV. Currently, water injection is being conducted through the feed water system and the CS system, and we are judging that the temperatures in the RPV and PCV remain to be cooled. As for Unit 3, judging from the difference between the, dry, between the water pressure in the suppression chamber and the pressure in the dry well that contains nitrogen, we think that the water height of the PCV is around the equator of the flask. On the other hand, for Unit 2, the water height has not been measured, but we assume it is between Units 3 and Unit 1. In any case, evaluations show that the fuel melted down to the PCV is on the whole substantially cooled down because there is water at the bottom of the PCV. That is all concerning the summary of the status of the damaged fuel. For reference purposes on page 25 concerning Unit 1's local situation, we have reported on the generated steam from the first floor of the southeast area of Unit 1, and under the floor, the water that leaked from the suppression pool has accumulated. Generated steam was not observed on October 13th, and this is the evidence by which we think the area of the suppression chamber has been cooled.
this the picture shows the local situation of the fifth floor of the reactor building of Unit 2, which was taken by a camera installed for sampling. The generated steam was not verified on October 20th, though it was verified on September 17th. Also, the paint on the overhead crane came off on October 20th. So we think this situation indicates that the generated steam has ceased, resulting in a parched environment. As for Unit 3, no direct photographs were taken. The temperature above the reactor was 128 degrees through the thermal monitor on May 20th, but on October 14th, the areas of temperature increase became smaller. Hence, we believe that high temperature steam is not leaking from the PCV.